Okay. Hi, everyone. I think we're live. I'm going to give it just a minute to let people trickle in here. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Wynn Foster. Um, I graduated from Haverford College. Um, my undergrad is a double major in astronomy and physics. Um, since then, um, I sort of left the like astrophysics world and I'm working in data science, but I'm still very active with the, um, with the astronomy club. And uh, I'm still really, really passionate about astro and I wanted to sort of give an outreach talk uh, and I know a fair bit of gravitational waves, so I thought that would be an okay place to start. Um, so just in terms of uh, questions and things, like please type them into the comments. I think there's a little bit of latency between when I'm talking and when things are appearing. So um, I'll answer most questions at the end, but yeah, feel free to type them in whenever and I'll get to them. Um, so basically the sort of important context for gravitational waves um, are that there's sort of this new frontier in astronomy. Um, uh, gravitational waves are part of, uh, of Einstein's math, um, which is where this all started, but um, I think we'll start at the end here. Basically, gravitational waves won the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics um, after members of the LIGO and Virgo Consortium um, were able to detect a gravitational wave merger from two binary black holes that coalesced into one and sent out gravitational waves across the universe, which we were able to detect here on Earth. Um, these waves were initially predicted by Albert Einstein in 1915 as a part of his theory of general relativity. Um, so it's taken over 100 years uh, for us to actually confirm their existence directly. Um, and, uh, but yeah, this is a long-awaited um, sort of confirmation to the theory of relativity. It's sort of the capstone of the theory of relativity in a way, because um, it's one of the most direct sort of and high-powered uh, confirmations of the theory. Um, uh, and um, another sort of one of the biggest points here is that this uh, it's a fundamentally different kind of observations from some of the kinds we usually do. Um, so most of astronomy is kind of collecting light and gravitational waves are completely different. There's no light involved. We're literally seeing stretches in the fabric of space time. And so it's a fundamentally different way to experience and observe the universe. So you can kind of thinking about it as sort of hearing the universe versus seeing it. I think it's a pretty useful analogy. Um, so just a little background on what we're going to be going through. Um, just some backgrounds on gravitational waves and GR. Um, I'll talk about the detection methods. Um, for those of you who have some familiarity with this, I'm going to primarily talk about LIGO, um, just because it's sort of the forefront of this, but there's a lot of other uh, observations and missions as well. Um, I'll talk about a couple observations, including one that was sort of groundbreaking that was announced just last week. Um, and then we'll talk about learning's outlook, and then I'll have some time at the end to answer any questions you might have. Um, so what are gravitational waves? Um, they are ripples in space-time created by massive objects. And they're sort of similar to ripples in a pond, where the idea is if you were to drop a rock into a pond, you create these ripples, and these ripples would sort of propagate out and distort the light that comes through them and distort what you're seeing. And in a lot of ways, gravitational waves work exactly the same way, but for, um, but for matter. So um, what they... Um, Basically, as they propagate through space-time, they kind of stretch and they push and pull on the space-time that we're all kind of living on. And they will basically just sort of shorten and extend distances and create tiny forces, um, very, very small amounts, and we'd like to be able to detect them. Um, they're, again, they're completely unobservable using sort of conventional radiation because um, they have nothing to do with EM radiation. Um, but they are believed to be some of the most energetic events in the universe, um, and we haven't really been able to detect them until now. Um, so gravitational waves are a byproduct of Einstein's general relativity. 
So what we're seeing here in the figure on the right is actually Einstein's relativity. So Einstein postulated and was able to confirm that matter kind of warps and stretches the geometry of space-time. Um, so a massive object will actually stretch sort of this fabric, kind of like a bowling ball on a trampoline. And in turn, that leads to the forces that we experience as gravity. Um, and that's sort of, so the basic premise is that this is what gravity has, but, um, or sorry, this is how gravity is created. Um, but it goes a lot further than that. So Einstein sort of kept looking and figured out that if this were to be correct, um, Einstein's math said that there, if you had two massive objects sort of orbiting each other, you generate these ripples, kind of like, um, going back to the bowling ball and trampoline example, if you kind of imagine kids running around the trampoline, they're going to create, um, sort of this pitter patter effect, um, and send ripples out. So, um, he was able to confirm that, you were able to, uh, sort of infer that mathematically, but we weren't really able to see it until recently. So what I'm showing you now is um, just a rendering of a, a coalescing binary. So this is uh, just a rendering of two neutron stars here. And then in blue is just an example of what these ripples might look like. So as these two very dense, very massive objects rotate around each other, they send out these gravitational waves and slowly spiral in towards each other. And eventually, and they start to speed up as they do, and eventually they'll coalesce into one object and send out, and that's sort of what we'll be able to detect in the end. And then ultimately, there's just going to be that one object remaining. Um, so going forward, just to talk about a little bit how this manifests on Earth, um, this GIF kind of just shows uh, basically just this sort of pulling and pushing effect that the gravitational waves have as they travel. So this is obviously sort of a, a quite an exaggeration. Um, but as a gravitational wave passes through the planet or passes through the objects on the planet, things are going to be slightly stretched out, either pushed or pulled and the distances will be slightly, slightly different. Um, <clears throat> and these distances are very, very small. So like all of Earth on its own um, is only gonna be stretched by like basically, I think less than a single atomic diameter. Like this could be roughly the extent of a proton. So the distance scales here are very, very, very small, but we can still detect them. <clears throat> Excuse me, so moving along, how do we actually detect gravitational waves? Um, and in order to do that, we use um, sort of the sort of foremost experiment for this is LIGO, the Laser Inter Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. So LIGO is a is sort of a project um, from Caltech, MIT, and it's funded by uh, the federal government with the National Science Foundation. Um, and it was sort of first conceived back in the 60s as a way to detect gravitational waves, but it didn't really get started until the 90s, and they built it in the early 2000s. And then only just a few years ago did they finally actually confirm gravitational wave. But basically how it works is you have these two detectors on either side of the US. Um, and there are two both just to sort of confirm the theory. Um, because basically if you detect a you know, new wave that no one's ever seen before and you only have one detector, no one's going to believe you. But if you create two and they both see it at the same time, then you actually have something. Um, so basically they have two detectors. It's also going to help you localize later, which we'll talk about. Um, but the idea here is you have two detectors and you have these two arms going down. So here you can see, um, this is the site in uh, Livingston, Louisiana, and here's the site in Hanford in Washington state. Um, and these arms are about four kilometers long and they have kind of a laser going down. And we'll talk about what that laser does in just a second, but they're these huge sites on either side of the country. And these arms are able to detect very minor changes in the distance um, of that four kilometers. And, and we'll see how they do that shortly. So the kind of key here, to these lasers and how they work is uh, in constructive and destructive interference. So this is true of all, of pretty much all waves, not just light, but the idea is waves can kind of constructively or destructively interfere. So when you have two waves on top of each other, um, as shown on the left here, if you can see that this wave on the top kind of cancels out this wave on the bottom. And if you add them together, those the energies will actually cancel out and there's basically nothing there. Although at the same time, if you have a, um, this wave here and this wave here, and they're adding up constructively, you actually get a wave that's twice as powerful. And so the lasers, the reason we have two arms here is because those lasers will then eventually go down their separate, um, their separate sort of arms and recombine, and they'll either form a constructive or destructive interference, depending on the exact lengths. And this pattern is very sensitive to the length of the tube. So, um, again, here's just a schematic of what this looks like. We have this laser source here, there's a beam splitter, um, and then the laser will travel four kilometers down this way, four kilometers down this way, and get recombined. And I have a animation of what that looks like here. So um, let me just see here. So basically you have this laser that's emitted 
And then the idea is as the gravitational wave passes through, uh, one arm versus the other arm might stretch it. So here it's going to show us the actual, um, this is an example of what the laser signal might look like. So here we have the photons coming down um, as one wave. They'll travel the four kilometers, hit the mirror on the end and come back. And then likewise, this laser is coming down, hitting its mirror and coming back. And they're going to recombine here and they're going to this detector plate. And then as of right now, the lasers are destructively interfering with each other. So you're not really seeing any light. But then, as you can see, if one of these things moves very so slightly, and this one moves ever so slightly, the lasers are going to start to constructively and destructively interfere. So as a gravitational wave passes through and stretches the relative lengths of these arms, even by just a little bit, you're going to see a pattern manifest here on this detector. And that's what LIGO is able to detect. So the scales here are very, very small. So LIGO is detecting um, basically like a thousandth of a proton, so along that four kilometer stretch of arm. Um, the gravitational wave is only stretching one of the arms relative to the other by like a thousandth of a proton, but that pattern we're seeing at the end is very, very sensitive to, to the, um, to distance. So that's enough to see a different interference pattern. And we can attribute that to a gravitational wave passing through once we've eliminated all the other factors. And I can talk about that more with some, if you guys have any questions about it. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about some detections here. Um, so on the right here, I just have sort of an example of a couple different detections that the LIGO and the Virgo team, Virgo is another um, detector based in Italy, um, and they collaborate on a lot of these. And this is just going to show a couple different gravitational waves and what they look like. So on the right here, you see um, you have two different masses here that are orbiting each other, and they basically send off this signal of gravitational waves, and as they orbit each other, um, and I'll show it again here, and as they get closer and closer, you'll see that the amplitude starts to increase. But at the same time, the frequency actually increases as well. So it's this very distinctive kind of chirping that we see. And then this is ring down at the end. Um, and so here's just a plot of, um, this is actually the first gravitational wave ever detected. Um, but here's a plot of what that looks like, where as they get closer, you see this sort of like um, sort of ringing as they get closer. And then there's a, coales um, there's a coalescence here. And then you have this kind of ring down as it sort of coalesces into a single object and is no longer producing any gravitational waves. Um, so, uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple different detections. Um, there, I'm going to talk about three detections at all. Um, the first one is a uh, gravitational wave 1509-14. Um, these are just dated. So basically this is 2015, September 14th. Um, this is the first detection ever. Um, even though it happened in 2015, September, it wasn't actually announced until February of 2016, because again, there's a lot of sort of backend analysis. We just want to confirm that that this isn't a false alarm and that truly we've ruled out every other possible possible outcome and that this is in fact a gravitational wave. So um, as I said, this is the first direct observation of a gravitational wave. Um, and some of the individuals involved with this team were actually awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics for this because it is such a groundbreaking observation. Again, as I said, this is sort of, we're still just sort of able to confirm some of Einstein's theories over a century later. And um, this is both sort of an incredible discovery, not only because we were able to sort of confirm this in, in one of the sort of strongest and sort of high energy ways possible, um, but also because it opens up this completely new field of science for us, which we kind of speculated was there for over 100 years, but we're never able to determine. Um, so again, this is uh, both a confirmation of something old and it completely opens the door to something completely new. Um, and then the next one I want to talk about uh, this one happened a little bit later. So this is gravitational wave 170817. So this gravitational wave, again, was discovered in August of 2017. And this was not actually two black holes that were merging together to form um, these waves. It was actually two neutron stars. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about neutron stars versus black holes. Um, black holes, as you may know, are sort of the densest objects in the universe. And um, they're so dense and so massive that light cannot escape from a black hole. There are these singularities that um, initially people didn't really, they weren't sure whether or not they were real, but the math kind of suggested that they must be real and people have been able to find them. Uh, neutron stars are actually the remnant of a star that has, that has died. Um, so it's sort of exploded and left behind this core, which is this neutron star. It's again ultra dense, not quite as dense as a black hole, but still very, very dense. Um, and so we also saw, and they're actually reasonably common in the universe. Um, we have a lot of stars and a lot of them do explode and become neutron stars. And so we see a lot of neutron stars. And so in this case, there are two neutron stars orbiting and they again sort of merge and start to coalesce. 
Um, and again, this is hypothesized. People had sort of named this a kilonova. Um, and these were hypothesized for quite some time, but no one, and people speculated that they may have seen them just um, by seeing, we see uh, gamma ray bursts and sort of transient phenomena in other galaxies all the time. And people speculated that some of these events might actually be um, neutron stars um, sort of merging, but no one was really sure because we couldn't confirm it with gravitational waves. So when this event happened, this was actually triangulated and we were able to, to pin it down to a specific galaxy. And because of that, there were follow-up observations. So this was one of the first sort of multi-messenger um, uh, astrophysical phenomena where we were able to first identify the gravitational waves, then identify some of, um, some of the photons coming off from this event, and then sort of like put two and two together and create this whole map of how this event happened and what happened after it. Um, and then um, finally, this event, um, we believe that these events are generate a lot of the uh, the heavier elements in the galaxy or in the universe. So basically everything heavier than iron, we believe, has come from either sort of a supernova or a kilonova of some kind. Um, because so the way stars uh, fusion works, you just you know, they can't really fuse anything heavier than iron. And uh, we don't believe it came from the Big Bang. So pretty much these events will sort of seed the universe with everything heavier than iron, think like gold or uranium or platinum or anything like that. Um, the next thing I want to show you is again, this is the same event. This is GW170817. Um, we have, uh, this is just sort of a, a series of different observations that are all sort of tied together here. So um, there's a lot happening on this chart, but I'm gonna walk you through it. So up here at the top, this is the LIGO and Virgo signal. So again, if you look at time versus frequency, we're seeing that characteristic chirp. So it's kind of going back and forth. And then finally you get this high frequency noise up here before it dies down. And so that immediately said, okay, there's a gravitational wave somewhere. But these instruments aren't the best at kind of localizing. So here you can see on the map on the right, in blue you have, um, or I'm sorry, in green, you have uh, the LIGO Virgo localization, where basically they were just triangulating using their three detectors to try and figure out where in the night sky it was. And then likewise, at the same time, there's a satellite in orbit called Fermi, which is a gamma ray detector. And it detected an event like I think 1.7 seconds after and it also started to localize it. And again, it's not super accurate, but between the LIGO and the Virgo and the GAMI, uh, or sorry, the Fermi uh, gamma ray observations, we, um, people were able to sort of pin it down to a rough patch in the, gal or in, the, in the universe, a rough patch in the night sky. And so telescopes started to look for it and identify it as being somewhere in the Southern hemisphere. So after a few hours, telescopes on earth were able to sort of survey the night sky and locate the object, basically seeing just a small dot. And here's just a couple of examples of this. In this galaxy, um, basically there was this small dot which wasn't there before, and they were able to identify it as the source of this, uh, um, of both the gravitational waves and the gamma ray burst. And so from then on out, people could start to sort of uh, profile the light curve and how that changed over time to get a really complete picture of this kilonova event. Um, and then finally, one of the uh, the final event I want to talk about is uh, GW 1905-21. So this event was in. May of 2019. Uh, this was actually announced just last week. So even though this was recorded in um, in 2019, again, this was a again these these take a while to confirm. So this was announced just last week. Um, this was two very massive uh, black holes merging. So the masses involved here were six for 85 times the mass of the sun was one black hole, and then 66 times the mass of the sun for the second black hole. Um, and just and they uh, just for comparison with the, with some of the other mergers, like the first one we saw that they were like 36 and 29. So these are you know three times more massive or more are the uh, black holes involved, and they merge into a black hole which is 142 solar masses. Um, so 85 mass so 85 solar masses and 66 solar masses merging into 142 solar masses. If you're doing that mental math quickly, you'll discover that nine solar masses are missing from that number. So what actually happened there is those nine solar masses were converted into energy and radiated out as gravitational waves. So if any of you remember E equals mc squared, that's really the equivalent, equivalence between mass and energy, um, again, that Einstein found. And basically you have nine, nine times where if the mass of our sun was sort of immediately evaporated, converted into energy, and that energy radiated out in the form of gravitational waves. So with that amount of energy, this is the most energetic event ever observed by humans in the universe. Um, and um, it basically outshined all of the stars in the entire universe for a fraction of a second as this merger took place. 
but none of it was in light. Like, and that's, and that's very important here. Absolutely none of that was radiated out using the conventional like e radiation. So none of our telescopes on Earth would have been able to see it. It's only detectable by these LIGO and Virgo instruments. Um, and then the other kind of key thing here is the masses are, are huge. This is the first ever detection of what we call an intermediate mass black hole. Um, so black holes effectively come in two different flavors. So there were supermassive black holes, which have like masses of hundreds of thousands of times the mass of our sun. And then there are stellar mass black holes, which are, you know, in the ballpark of, you know, five to maybe 30 masses, um, solar masses. But this was, again, these are 85 and 66 merging into 142. And these types of black holes have sort of been theorized to exist, but no one's been able to find them directly up until now. And it's sort of an open problem is, is there's no reason they shouldn't exist, but we don't, aren't really sure whether they do or not. And to be honest, we're not really sure quite what to do with that. I think a lot of science will come out in the coming weeks, months, and even years. Um, there's some speculation that maybe, you know, these, these massive black holes may have already kind of accreted and coalesced several times to get as large as they are. And they're just coalescing one more time to get even bigger. There's some speculation that maybe the, the kind of initial masses, the 85 and 66, are maybe left over from the Big Bang. Um, and they were created basically with the creation of the universe and have been floating around ever since. Um, that's called a primordial black hole. That's a different theory. Um, but in any case, this is this is sort of the first confirmation of this, and no one's ever seen one of these before. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's basically just a huge, uh, a, lot, a lot of questions have been answered, but also there's a lot more questions that are, are not posed by, by this event. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about some upcoming missions. Um, one of the things I want to, to emphasize here is that, well, gravitational wave astronomy has exploded in the public view very, very recently, and just really in the last five years. This has been an ongoing field for a very, very long time. So again, the timeline here is Einstein first proposed these in 1915. Um, people sort of discussed them as maybe they might exist, maybe they might, might not. Starting in the 60s, um, and potentially even earlier, people started talking about whether or not they could build detectors that could actually detect these things because for a while they were just thought to be so, so small that we'd never know whether or not they exist and it would never be uh, a piece of general relativity that could be confirmed. But starting in the 60s, people started to debate, well, maybe we could build one of these LIGO type um, interferometers. And so people built a couple sort of prototypes of this. Um, and then starting in the 80s, people built like a larger prototype and were able to secure some NSF funding, um, but that didn't really go anywhere. And there's some other programs going on as well at the same time. And then they finally started building LIGO in the 90s and it came online in 2002 and it never detected anything um, over basically 2002 to um, I believe 2010. And then they kind of upgraded it. So they basically just made um, some improvements to increase the effective range in this, uh, and, and the detection threshold. And then this is sort of the new advanced LIGO and they finally were able to detect a gravitational wave in 2015. So again, 100 years later. Um, but there are also a lot of other missions going on at the moment. So aside from LIGO and Virgo in Italy, um, this is, uh, Nanograv is another um, is another uh, sort of gravitational wave mission going on right now. They don't use uh, these types of detectors at all. They use something called pulsar timing arrays, um, where basically you have pulsars, which are these very sort of periodically rotating stars, and they're like hyper accurate clocks, and they're some of the most sort of like accurate clocks in the universe and they can detect whether or not those pulses are arrive a little bit earlier, or a little bit later than expected. And they can use that to kind of back into whether or not a gravitational wave may have passed by. Um, then um, there's another one called LISA, which is planned, which will be a laser interferometer, but in space um, with arms that are, I believe like two and a half kilometer or two and a half million kilometers. So definitely an upgrade from the four kilometer uh, LIGO arms. Um, so again, a space-based interferometer would again increase the sensitivity and allow us to look for more waves. Um, but then uh, finally, I just want to talk about how this broadens horizons across so many different fields in astronomy um, and to a certain extent physics as well. Um, so right off the bat, so the obvious contenders here are neutron stars, stellar astrophysics, and uh, nucleosynthesis, which we talked about. Um, so we don't know, I mean, we, we have a fair understanding of what neutron stars are and how they form. Uh, but of course, when we see a merger like this, we're able to gain so much more information about the masses involved. Um, whether or not they're spinning or not, because there's a lot of, sort of conjecture on that. Um, and, um, and sort of what they're made of. We can see when these stars merge, they kind of spill some of their guts out into the universe and we can s start to see what that looks like. Um, again, with stellar astrophysics, um, we're not really sure 
how many black holes versus neutron stars there are. Um, we have some guesses, but this will help us sort of figure that out. And again, with nucleosynthesis, it's telling us a lot more about it. Giving, it's giving us constraints on like galactic formation or stellar formation because these events are sort of seeding the universe with, with heavy elements. Uh, we can sort of compare that to the heavy elements we're seeing in our galaxy and others. Um, and the next one is obviously intermediate mass black holes. Um, so again, no one has ever seen one of these before. Um, this 142 mass, um, uh, uh, excuse me, 142 solar mass black hole is really sort of the first of its kind. And that is a huge, huge open question. Um, another thing is cosmology and the age of the universe. Uh, people can use gravitational wave to, to sort of come up with a best guess about how old the universe is. Um, basically to try and constrain this thing called the Hubble constant. Um, there are a couple different ways to do that currently, but this is a completely new way to do it, which will add a lot of our observations because there's a lot of uncertainty in the Hubble constant right now because not all of the measurements agree. Um, finally, there are particle physics constraints. Um, so there's a proposed particle called the graviton and people aren't entirely sure what, how, what the mass of the graviton would be and the presence of gravitational waves. And if you assess sort of how quickly the light travels versus how quickly the gravity travels, that allows you to sort of put an upper limit on the mass of the graviton. And so people believe there's either a massless graviton or a very low mass graviton based on, um, based on these, these events. And then finally, and I just want to sort of harp on this point again, this is a fundamentally new method of observation. Um, like this really is sort of the future of astronomy. Um, like it's, it's pretty much like pr just about all of astronomy up to now is, is some variant of, of looking at photons and assessing how bright that is and how bright the signal you're seeing is, um, and looking through telescopes. I mean, really from Galileo up to now, everything has sort of involved telescopes and this is just completely new and it's completely different. Um, so again, this is sort of allowing us to look inside of galaxies where that otherwise might, but otherwise might be obscured with, uh, with gas and dust. Um, it's allowing us to look potentially, some of the new experiments might allow us to look beyond the sort of wall of photons at the edge of our universe and see what might have happened sort of close to the Big Bang and look for gravitational waves there. Um, and again, this is also allowing us to kind of tie together, like we can sort of cross-reference these new gravitational wave events with some older events like supernova that we have an okay handle on, but would obviously love to know a little bit more about. Um, and, um, and so obviously there's just a lot of... Uh, the gravitational waves have solved a lot of questions for us, but they've also opened a lot more. Um, so just wrapping up here, uh, gravitational waves are caused by ripples in the space-time. These were first predicted by Einstein, but they were not confirmed for over a century. Um, again, these are a completely different method of observation. Um, following the first detection, um, the announcement of the first detection in 2016, ligo Virgo has, in, has um, confirmed observations of about 15-ish more black hole mergers um, or neutron star mergers. And obviously recent observations like this new intermediate, intermediate mass black hole have created a lot more questions and also answered a lot of questions about the nature of our universe. So with that, thank you guys. I will take some questions now. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, what, la what wavelength is the laser they use? I actually don't know that off the top of my head. Um, I believe it's in the visible spectrum, but I'm not positive. Um, what else? Do I have pictures? Um, Elena, do I have pictures of, of what exactly? I can point you in the direction of, of pictures. I have a lot of graphics. Um, the Caltech LIGO site is a really, really helpful place to find um, some pictures and visualizations. And most of the sort of background visualizations that I've shown here are, are, are drawn from there. And I've included citations on all of my frames if you want to go um, check them out. Um, what else? The Weber bar. Um, OK, so uh, Riley is mentioning the Weber bar, which was this sort of experiment of uh, basically the idea was that if you could isolate, um, instead of sort of seeing whether or not the lengths of an object would change, if you could kind of isolate something and if the gravitational wave would pass through it, it would kind of vibrate. Um, and the idea was to look for sort of thermal fluctuations and vibrations. But the problem was it was too difficult to isolate um, from just like earthquakes and electromagnetic radiation and anything else. And basically the signal to noise ratio just wasn't really solid. And although people said they may have detected some things, this was back in the 60s, it was never really confirmed. Um, what else?
Um, the simulation in the Uh, I believe, um, Irene, that gravitational waves are given off primarily in the plane. Um, well, I'm sorry, I, ha I have to think about that and get back to you. I know they kind of move one way and then the other way, so there's potentially some instances in which LIGO doesn't detect a gravitational wave if it passes through at the right angle because both arms stretch the same amount. Um, I, that's a good question. I have to think about that. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll get back to you on that one. I'll reply to your comment. Um, what else? Uh, are two LIGOs oriented differently so to determine direct directionality? Uh, yes, they are. So I'll just go back to this graphic here, and you can see the Hanford site up in Washington and the Livingston site in Louisiana. And yes, they are oriented differently because of uh, what I just mentioned. Um, as they kind of push and pull, again, the way these interferometers work is they only look at the relative difference between the two, between the two arms. So if you have a gravitational wave that kind of hits it at the right angle, it might pass directly through. Like if, I, if, if it travels directly down one of the arms, it may not stretch the arms at all, but it could potentially stretch the arms of the other one. Basically, they're oriented in such a way that they're never both going to be blind to detect detection at the same time. And then going around the world to Italy, there's a third detector, which again is sort of at a completely different orientation. So between those three, you can um, you can start to sort of localize. And it's not just um, because of what it, it's even helpful like if there if one. So here I'll just go back to this localization. Um, for this gravitational wave, for, um, Virgo really didn't detect that much of an amplitude at all, but that was still really helpful in, detect in, in localizing in localizing location because it implied that if this was sort of in Virgo's, or um, if, if this was in Virgo's blind spot, like Virgo should have been able to detect it, but didn't, which helped constrain the positioning as well, beyond just what the two LIGO arms could have done alone. Um, also important is the fact that there's a delay between the two. So gravitational waves travel roughly at the same speed of light. We believe they travel at the speed of light, but can't confirm that. I mean, they travel pretty close. Um, the gamma rays from this uh, neutron star merger and the gravitational waves arrive within like 1.7 seconds of each other, but we can't say definitively that they travel at exactly the same speed. But the idea is they're going to hit one, and then they're going to hit the other, and they'll hit Virgo at some other time, and that again will help us constrain the uh, it, uh, constrain where in the night sky they are. Um, okay, Irene is asking about the mass gap for um, intermediate black holes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so there's two things sort of called uh, the mass gap, um, which both of which are potentially relevant here. So, this animation which I showed was neutron stars. Um, there is a mass gap right now between neutron stars and, black, and stellar mass black holes. So basically just the nature of neutron stars is, um, is that they can only be specific masses. Um, so basically starting at 1.4 masses and working their way up. And eventually, uh, they are basically things that get too massive stop, or aren't neutron stars and they collapse under their own gravity to become black holes. And we don't know exactly what ma at what mass that happens. Um, it could be as little as two, or it could be greater, like maybe five or eight or so. We're not 100% sure. So there's kind of this mass gap where, um, here at the very end here, I have a um, sort of a poster with all of the LIGO detections. Um, you can see here that um, they have things labeled as either black holes or neutron stars. And if you see, there's a couple question marks in here in this mass gap, somewhere between two and five uh, solar masses. We're not 100% sure whether these are black holes or neutron stars. Um, so that's sort of one mass gap. But then I think the mass gap that you might be asking about is um, for uh, intermediate mass black holes versus st uh, stellar mass black holes versus supermassive black holes. So stellar mass black holes are kind of, again, in this 5-ish to 80-ish range. Um, although 80 is sort of trending a bit high. Um, and these come from collapsing stars. Um, so basically stars will collapse, uh, they'll go supernova, and they'll leave behind these remnants. So if you have a star that's maybe 300-ish solar masses, which is really, really high for a star. Not many of them live that long, or not many of them form that way, and we don't believe that there are too many of them right now. We think they're more common in the early universe. Then they'll collapse and leave behind a black hole of, of less mass because it's just sort of the stellar core that's collapsing, and the rest of the uh, of the matter sort of 
ejected outwards. Um, and then we get supermassive black holes. And those are a little weird. We don't have a great grasp. Well, I'm not going to say we. I don't know 100% how they form. Um, I don't know what the latest literature is on that. Um, but those are in the hundreds of thousands of, ma of solar masses. And those we believe is one pretty much at the center of every galaxy. Um, and we don't believe that those were just kind of coalescing black holes up and up and up until they became as big as they are. We think those maybe came from the early universe, um, but we're not 100% sure. But there's this huge gap basically between, you know, 100 solar masses and 100,000 solar masses. And we haven't seen, um, and we haven't really seen um, that anything kind of in between that gap. Um, someone else is responding, I do believe gravitational waves propagate some of the white waves. Light waves. Yeah, I, I believe they do, but there's a couple, because it's not, because it's a dipole, it, 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 it propagates in a slightly different way. Like the fall off is not one over R squared, it's one over R. Um, and again, the directionality doesn't matter, like they're polarized. Um, so you can't definitively say how powerful a gravitational wave will be. It depends on your orientation. And basically as it travels, they kind of stretch one way and then the other way. And then so it kind of depends on how it hits you, but I believe you're, you're right that the sort of average power just propagates out in all directions. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions. Um, so I'll give it maybe one more minute. Um, so last call for questions. And, um, and then, yeah, I'm happy to answer any more. Um, if you leave comments, I can get back to you later. Um, but yeah, sort of let me know if you have any more questions and then I'll sign off. How do the instruments across the country correct for changes in distances between each other for things like earthquakes, tectonic plates? Um, so they don't need to correct for the distances between each other, um, if that makes sense. The only thing that matters is the relative, um, here, I'll go back to this slide. The only thing that matters is the relative length of this arm in one detector versus this arm in the same detector. So if this one's four kilometers and this is four kilometers plus a thousandth of a proton, that will be detected by the, by the interference pattern and that will change the interference pattern. Um, and that will basically signal that there is a gravitational wave happening. Um, this distance between the Hanford and the Livingston and then also the, the Virgo detector in Italy doesn't matter quite. So it doesn't matter from a detection standpoint. Um, obviously, I guess it does matter from maybe a localization standpoint, like if this one's gonna be a little bit farther away or if they get the distance slightly wrong, then I guess, yeah, that might throw off the localization a bit. Um, but I think that's a pretty, a pretty reasonable, like we're not great at localizing anyway. Like I, I don't think that's a huge, um, a hugely important variable in terms of, in terms of localization, because ultimately people have to hunt a bit for these anyway, like showing, um, I'll show the slide again. Like there's still a lot of, of night sky that had to be searched. Um, and eventually people were able to find it. Um, alrighty. Could we use gravitational waves to communicate with distant civilizations already being spoken to by aliens? That's a great question. Um, I'm gonna say probably not to the already being spoken to by aliens. And could we use them to communicate? I think we'd have to get a lot, we have to figure out how to make a really, really, we have to get a lot of mass in one place and then move it very quickly. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's a, this is a, this is, I realize this is a joke question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. I, I want to say it's not impossible, but we'd have to kind of find a way to, uh, to collide some very massive objects and hope that the aliens are in fact uh, listening. And with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and sign off. So thank you guys very much for, a, um, for hanging out and listening to me talk. And uh, again, please leave any more comments if you have any more questions. I'll, I'll check them later tonight and maybe tomorrow morning as well and answer anything else. So thank you guys. Bye.